let us begin this session. Uh, welcome again. My name is Vidyadhar Atkore. I'm a part of a CIS OC members. So after having long workshops and exciting poster session, in this session, we would like to uh, invite of the elite panelists to talk about their ideas in conservation. Now, <clears throat> our the panelists have expertise in the range of fields, including arts, communication, academia, and forest departments. We are extremely lucky to have them here, and I feel this panel discussion is extremely important for all the student community and conservation uh, related researchers, especially to solve the contemporary conservation challenges that we have today, as well as it will also offer the multitude opportunities that are existing in different fields. With this few words, I would like to invite my colleague Ishika to moderate this panel discussion. Uh, she will take forward from here. Yeah. Thanks, Vidya. Um, so like Vidya was saying, uh, we have a super lineup and uh, really excited to have everyone here with us. And I hope uh, the fact that they all come from very diverse backgrounds and are doing very interesting things presently in the field will, um, will be very informative and also give you uh, the opportunity to ask them a lot of questions that might be uh, kind of swirling in your mind right now as you all enter the field. So uh, first up, we have Sangeeta Kadur, who is a wildlife and nature artist, and her creative career spans nearly two decades. I'm sure a lot of you have already come across her work on online, through books, on social media. She works on a lot of educational material, has written children's books, and of course is also very famous for her nature journaling and for starting green scraps. Uh, we have Tarsh with us as well, who is a researcher conservationist, who is associated with the Shola Trust, with the Natural, Cent uh, National Center for Biological Sciences, and also the Lantana elephants that you see outside. And he's interested in a lot of human inclusive ways of running con uh, conservation. So a lot to see and learn from him as well. We also have Sahil with us, who is an interdisciplinary researcher at NCF. And he's had a very interesting career moving from engineering to conservation biology to anthropology, and now a very interesting mix of a bunch of things it, to do a lot of collaborative conservation work, which includes local communities. So again, a lot of questions there for him. Uh, we have Karthikeni with us, who is a young IFS officer with the Tamil Nadu Forest Department. She has a background in agriculture and is currently the assistant conservator of forests. She's also working with a lot of local communities to tackle a lot of challenges like hunting, poaching, and is doing some fantastic work there. So I'm excited to speak with you too. And uh, we have Bhanu with us, who is a senior reporter at Citizen Matters, which focuses on stories revolving around the environment. And she has a background in ecology, and she began with writing a lot uh, in the space of wildlife. And now she writes a lot about environmental issues in urban spaces. So uh, I'd now like to call all of you up onto the stage, and then we can begin the discussion. So let's start off with just trying to understand a little bit more about each journey that you're, you have been through. How did you get to the point where you currently are at in your career? And uh, if you had to make any switches along the way, you can also reflect upon that and uh, give us a quick overview of what that's been like for you. Yeah, would you like to start? So good evening, everyone. and. Uh, my journey to this location or to this position is started with my uh, 
uh, village or the place where i born i grew up seeing greenery all over the location as either as forest or agriculture and i had natural interest towards this biological sciences which which forced me or pushed me towards taking up this undergraduate in agriculture and my college which gave me which showed me that these are opportunities over there and generally i had that inclination towards managerial capacity and hence i chose ifs because it's a mix of uh, biological science and uh, having managerial capacity in it so that's what the journey is about and i have been uh, as cfs officer for the past 3 uh, years working as district forest officer in hosur forest division tamil nadu thank you thank you uh, ishika and uh, yeah great to be here everyone and see so many uh, bright faces uh, in the audience um, so my background uh, i think similar to kartikeni ma'am um, i grew up in the nilgiris and was always interested in conservation and wildlife and everything um, but i didn't really know you could do it as a career in that sense and i was good at maths and physics in school so i ended up doing science and my bachelor's was in maths physics electronics um, but i never really liked either living in a city my first job was with sap so software company in bangalore but i never liked living here so i used to keep going back uh, for extended periods to the nilgiris um and i got more involved with uh, actually teaching in a school for tribal children i used to again teach maths and physics um and uh, a group of us who were kind of more enthusiasts set up the shola trust in 2008 without ever wanting to be a large conservation organization or a conservation organization in any shape or form it was more trust where we bought up some land that was going to be developed by resort uh, by raising money through family and friends um but from there i got more interested in conservation and i kind of grew into the organization and became a conservationist because the shola trust existed as an institution almost uh, we didn't really have salaries or funded programs but everyone associate me as a conservationist um and so later i decided to do a masters uh, and phd to train more full time and then have been doing various other things since then um yeah my phd was part time over 8 years so it gave me a lot of space to do other things in between um and over the years i got a little disillusion with the ngo world as well and so we set up a, a non profit company uh, the real elephant collective that makes the lantana elephants i'm not really involved in that on day to day basis um, but the company is much bigger than the shola trust now and is raising money for multiple things including the coexistence consortium which we will maybe talk about in due course thank you hello everyone um so unlike tarsh and kartiki i did not grow up surrounded by nature I grew up in Delhi. There was not a lot of nature there. There was more nature there than there is now. Um and as a dutiful son that I try to be, I was destined to be an engineer. So I did engineering. Um I almost failed it because that's how uninterested I was in engineering. Um I was very lucky. I remember I was 19 and I I was always obsessed with animals. I mean the, and i also grew up in a household where we weren't allowed to watch tv so i would run away on the weekends to my grandma's to watch nat geo and discovery uh, and so i was really always obsessed with animals um and i went to see a friend in dehradun and he was like you like wildlife not far from my house is a place where people also like wildlife so they took me to the wildlife institute of india and the day that i ended up going there was the day when dr ajit johnson was retiring and i pranced into the auditorium and attended his retirement talk and i couldn't believe that there was an auditorium full of people who did wildlife for a living and that was really eye opening and i um i that's where everything began i went spoke to a professor there who took a took give me an opportunity ended up doing an internship at wii then applied um to study ecology in the us went there on a scholarship um did a masters in conservation um got a chance to spend 6 months in botswana um chasing lions and other large animals that i was obsessed with uh on the weekends at my grandma's tv um and uh and then uh worked in a conservation nonprofit in in the us um doing landscape ecology so a lot of remote sensing you know sort of satellite work uh but it was at that time that i was i would ask questions about the 
people that lived on the that owned the lands or lived around wildlife that we were obsessed with. I was obsessed with too. You know, big big cats. I they really kept me awake at night, and they do t till today. Um, but I never really got satisfactory answers, and I didn't really like the way uh, people were spoken about. Um, I didn't know any better, but I knew that that wasn't really sh that, that that didn't really sit well with me. So left that, got a degree in Spanish, uh, bummed around the world for a few more years, ended up back in India. Uh, and when I was back, I was more interested in learning about the people who shared lands and lives with wildlife. Um, that's what took me to Arunachal um, about 12 years ago, uh, and I'm still there. Um, did a PhD in anthropology where I studied the relationship between the Idumishmi people of Arunachal Pradesh and tigers. Um, and now, um, we, my Idu brothers and sisters and elders and I, we run a uh, program uh, in which we try to um, continue traditional ways of living, knowledge, and also all forms of life that have lived on the Idu land. It's kind of a longish answer. But <laughs> Thanks. Hi, I'm Bhanu. Um, so I don't like a lot of people you've seen that I also got quite a long-winded journey, but um, quite early on in life, I somehow decided I wanted to do something related to environment. And I was, I think I came from a place of a lot of idealism. And uh, through my early years, by, by the time I was in high school, I was spending a lot of time on Greenpeace websites learning about climate change. I think I can safely say I developed climate anxiety before it was a thing. But uh, basically, I became interested in this whole idea of doing something environment related. Slowly, it became a little broader. I became more interested in nature, biodiversity as well, to the extent that I was exposed to it in Bangalore City. And um, yeah, so I, I also did an undergrad, I did an undergraduate degree in uh, communication studies, and I was really interested in writing and I vaguely thought I might become an environmental journalist or a documentary filmmaker or something like that but I wasn't very sure but from there after graduation I worked with a couple of documentary filmmakers I used to write on the side to make some money uh, I used to I then came across this organization that was working on elephants in uh, the Banagata National Park in Bangalore so I interned with them. I became more interested in wildlife. I learned about the NCBS course. I applied, uh, got in, um, then worked as a researcher studying mangrove forests in the Andamans for my dissertation and for a couple of years after that. I worked with the conservation organization after that as a coordinator, largely administrative post, but looking at how to raise funds for conservation projects, things like that, which taught me a lot. Um, yeah, and somewhere along the way, I knew I wanted to, I didn't want to be a researcher. What I learned from all of these things was what I didn't want to be, which was I didn't want to be a researcher. I didn't want to be a conservationist because I wasn't sure uh, I had the confidence to say that this is what should be done in a landscape or this is what should be done for a species or that this is the cost that, say, somebody else may have to pay for those decisions. These are things I felt I couldn't commit to, uh, but I felt I had to find a way to explore these questions, and the best way seemed to be writing. So after that, I, I did an internship with Monga Bay, um, a six-month internship, and then I, I started freelancing, and I've been freelancing. Uh, I was freelancing ever since, and in February this year, I joined this um, local news media site called Citizen Matters, which focuses largely on urban issues in Bangalore, Chennai, and Mumbai. And uh, yeah, I've been looking at how urbanization has its, how, how urbanization impacts the environment, biodiversity, um, all of these things in different ways, uh, impacts people's right to livelihoods, impacts people's li rights to uh, natural spaces, all of these things has been an amazing learning experience because now I'm covering municipal governments, I'm covering health departments, um, and how they're managing an increased dengue outbreak because of climate change, things like that. So, yeah, it's it's just been a fantastic learning journey so far. Um, hello, everybody. 
So I think um, I've been fortunate enough to be surrounded by a whole family of nature lovers and um, starting with my father who was uh, an entomologist and uh, a stu he studied insects so always trying to show us all the little things around and I think the interest started uh, I think then I didn't know it was just like an everyday thing looking at um, uh, species all around me um, and um, I think my, it was my uncle who would take us all, all cousins and my brother, everybody, and plonk us into the forest, and we had to explore the wilderness. <coughs> Excuse my, co my cough. Um, we had to explore the wilderness since a young age, just staying out there, um, experiencing and exploring the wilderness around us was an excellent experience as in the growing up. I wouldn't trade it for anything. And uh, I never thought I would be in a field of wildlife at all. Um, <coughs> And I think uh, my, my grandfather was, again, a botany professor. And I think my love for plants probably comes from him. And um, uh, everyone pretty much uh, knows uh, my brother, Sandesh, and uh, the field that he is in. He's been a great inspiration and impact in my life as well. Um, pretty much growing up, there was some animal or the other in the room, uh, an owl one day, a snake under the bed, or just seeing all that while growing up has been uh, quite um, humbling. And I think somehow the admiration and the respect for the wild grew as I was growing up. And um, I think along the way, you try to befriend people also who are pretty much in the same circle. I think I joined the bird watcher circle in Bangalore and that has been quite uh, eye-opening. Um, just learning about uh, taking myself there and taking the interest to know more. Um, and I think just being surrounded by people. Also, many people in the bird watcher circle were opened my eyes to some of the uh, wildlife illustrations in books at that time. I was in art college when I started bird watching as well. And um, it was the biggest epiphany I think happened when I was at a birding survey at Bandipur. And uh, I met this artist, Sunita Dairyam, and she was painting this huge mural, which was about 15 feet by 10 feet. And in those days, this was in 2005, uh, 2004, 2005, and then uh, I was awestruck. I was just watching that and I'm like, uh, I was in my final year in art college at that time and I was awestruck. I, I just knew that this is what I wanted to do. And thankfully there has been no looking back and uh, I've been very fortunate for this journey. Uh, it's been interesting so far. I think the projects, it was definitely difficult as an artist to uh, push through in the early ages. There was not many mentors out there, but uh, somehow, but there were a lot of interesting, inspiring people to engage with and learn about the wildlife and uh, ecology around us. So uh, taking that as um, my, my first project, I think the biggest leap was um, the hummingbird book project. Uh, it was not, they're not Indian birds, but then it was a great opportunity to just learn the uh, how it works, how uh, the entire field of art and how to illustrate more seriously, more scientific, what is more professionally. Uh, there were some great mentors in the US who guided us, guided us and it was really uh, good. And uh, since then, it has been a lot of collaborations with some amazing organizations and people in uh, Bangalore and in India as well. And um, uh, we um, currently, right now, um, after many collaborations, uh, right now I'm really happy to be uh, setting up some of uh, some nature information centers, and uh, it is uh, it's an interesting experience because it's it's a teamwork, and it's just not one person. And uh, working with many artists who come with their own styles and different ways of interpreting art and things like that, just working with them put, to put together a bigger picture of a nature center has been the most exciting um, role right now. And I, I see myself doing that a lot more going forward. Thanks so much for all of that. It's it's actually quite mind-boggling to think of how many stages and points and corners of the possibilities within conservation just got covered. Um, I now wanted to ask you, 
to reflect upon each of these experiences a little bit. And for everyone in the audience, especially those who are students and early career researchers, how do they try to scope out what the entire expanse of this field is? How do they pick their path? Because for a lot of people now who are well-established in the field, like we saw even right now, some of it was just serendipitous, some of it was uh, lucky influences during your upbringing, and sometimes they're very planned and premediated steps to decide this is what I want to do and this is how I prepare for the next step. So now that you have this wealth of experience based on your specific expertise and what you're doing now, how can you explain the scope of the fields of ecology and conservation for the students in the audience today? Uh, I would like to brief the job or work nature of being an IFS officer. So it is more of a managerial capacity, as I have already mentioned, uh, because uh, as a manager, what do we manage? We manage forest. We are called forest managers. We are uh, managing some protected areas like wildlife sanctuaries or tiger reserve. We are protected area managers. So it is like managing the things below, either it is manpower or resources. <clears throat> whatever so mainly i can classify our management into three things like one is habitat management most of you might be working into it and Tash is one about and uh, second thing is uh, conflict management either it be human elephant conflict or any other animal conflict and we manage forest with the help of it's a joint forest management principle where the local people tribals or non-tribals who are depend on forest are taken into confidence for managing the forest area. So with the, with the resources available, adequate or inadequate, mostly inadequate, that can be manpower or funding, we need to run the show. That is the one important thing. And uh, it's your uh, ability to take decision that matters in this uh, position, I would say. Uh, because... Uh, we may be passionate about conservation. We may be passionate about birds and uh, animals. That we have free pass to go inside forest and take photographs. And uh, we'll be uh, privileged to watch many things which a common public may not be given opportunity. But more than all these things, the most important thing is decision-making ability. And we develop it after coming to the field. It is not like we have some ability and we come and sit and manage things. We come to this place and we see what are the challenges and the opportunities that we have. And uh, opportunity or uh, one important thing that I feel is we have people like uh, sitting over here and like you on the other side who are helping us to take informed decisions. That I would say is advantage sitting in a government sector because I am responsible and I am accountable for whatever activities happening in the forest and I have to be informed enough to take right decisions, right or wrong. So I, I would like to take all the opinions and consider and discuss with all the stakeholders, be it the conservationists or researchers or farmers or the uh, common uh, tribal people and other government departments. Because now today the conflict, which uh, conflict is mostly when animals comes out of forest and we have to depart, uh, we have to create confidence with EB department, highways, railways and etc. So it is about managing the things with the existing resources and manpower. So what I would like to tell uh, on your career is choose your own career because after coming here and seeing all these stalls and posters, I, I have come to know various types of methods or various ways where you can express your uh, interest towards conservation. Maybe it's an art, digital art, uh, handcraft and etc. Uh, so try to analyze the pros and cons being on each and every position. And uh, above all, the most important thing is what pulls you something which you are passionate about. Choose the path and that will make you happy throughout your career. Your life and career will not be a different thing. Then you will be following your passion in your life. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ishika, that was quite a long question and I'm still mulling over whether I remember all of the question and I can give a adequate answer, but uh, let's uh, give it a go. So I think broadly the scope of work, if I could maybe uh, kind of talk about that, the scope of what I do uh, is very varied. I think uh, that's the biggest challenge. 
because I work partly with the TDU, Transdisciplinary University, in and the Coexistence Consortium with mostly academic people uh, who are kind of pushing, all really great people who are pushing the kind of limits of ideas and thoughts in their field. Um, but I also work a lot with the government. I'm on the member of the of the State Wildlife Board for Tamil Nadu and I actively work with forest departments. And like ma'am said, it's primarily about decision making, um, which involves multiple people um, and not always in the best interest of what I think should be done, right? I'll give you a quick uh, story, which is really interesting, around an elephant capture um, some years ago. All of us talked about the elephants and there was a very nice discussion with all the officers uh, that happened. And we all agreed that there were two males that were probably responsible, one older and the younger one. The younger one, we could maybe translocate further away. The older one will translocate to the neighboring Mudumalai Park. It may come back, but we'll just monitor with a radio collar uh, very uh, aggressively and make sure there's less human interaction. But the next morning, uh, the chief minister had decided that both elephants have to be captured. Now, this is actually the way work, it works. And the forest department, a very nice officer who has, I've learned a lot from over the years, he called me in the morning and said, see, don't get upset. We took all your inputs. But please be aware that we work for a democratically elected government. And these people in power are making decisions which they believe are in the best interest of the people, not in the best interest of what you think as a person. So, yeah, the challenges in working with government and administrative officers and decision makers and the kind of things you have to communicate to them are very hard and very different. Uh, but with the Real Elephant Collective, I also work a lot with uh, the general public. Like these Lantana elephants, they go into very public exhibitions in the middle of cities. Uh, there was one in Cochin with about 20 lakh visitors. London had close to 50 lakh visitors. Um, and there, what the people are interested in, what you want to communicate is totally different. There, there are people who are not interested in conservation at all, right? And how do you communicate with them? Uh, how do you talk to them? How do you get them inspired about conservation is very different. Uh, again, I'll give you a quick story. I was sitting with a person once uh, in the UK who was a lawyer. And she was like, you study elephants. I mean, who gives you scholarship to study elephants? I'm a lawyer. What I'm doing is good for society. What you're doing is, uh, how is it good for society? Now, in my whole world till then, it was a given that if you're studying elephants, it would be wow, how exciting, how nice, right? And we all think that's the given. Like, of course, everybody loves elephants. Everybody will be very uh, excited that you work for elephants. But that is actually not the case if you do a random sampling of the whole world in some sense, right? Um, so it's been a real, great experience. And at the, at the Real Elephant Collective, I work with my wife who's a designer, um, other colleagues who are not in conservation at all. And it's an everyday learning process of what I take for granted as a general kind of thing that everybody agrees on is not the case. You have to constantly question that. It's quite hard to do all this, uh, but I find it really interesting and challenging. Um, but I'm also, I'm personally, I'm quite keen on keeping like one foot in the ground. That's why I live in the Nilgiris and I try to keep doing field work. Most of my work now is around Lantana and how we can more effectively remove it with local communities at the forefront, getting a livelihood for local communities and removing it at scale. Um, so I do try to spend a lot time in the field, interacting with people on the ground. And I think that's also really important. That perspective of continually engaging with people on the ground is vital so you don't get lost in all of uh, the kind of chatter that's happening at higher levels. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little stumped on how to answer <laughs> that, that question too, but I'll just blabber a little bit. Um, I, um, I mean, I've, I've, like I said, I've come from a very different background to what I do today. Uh, and I think I was at the right place at the right time and met the right people who decided to show me immense generosity and support and took risks with me. And that began 20 years ago and still continues. Um, and m many, many times I was told that this is not what you should do, this is not how you should behave, this is, now, this is not the right question, this is too ambitious, this is too stupid. Um, b b from, the fa from my family, from different mentors, from professors, supervisors, all kinds of people. But there were, there were enough people who allowed me to do what I, what I wanted to and allowed me to ask the questions I wanted to. Um, so I think it was, I, I, do, I, I do what I do because of the generosity of a lot of people. Uh, in terms of um, the the work, I'm talking about the work, right? Yeah, uh, the scope of the work. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, uh, what I do now is uh, directly. Um, I do things that respond to my politics, politics of life, um, and um, 
my politics of life is deeply grounded in rights, rights for those who have been marginalized, whether they are, they are people or certain categories of people or certain categories of animals. Um, and that kind of uh, directs the questions I ask and then who I work with, who I work for, um, and who I'm accountable to. Um, this is um, a little bit challenging sometimes, uh, but what I've found that uh, really pays is um, having a story. Um, having a story, uh, either the story of the work, story of yourself, um, and, and telling that story in ways that can make even the non-believers, like the lawyer, uh, spit out a little bit of money uh, and start believing. Um, and it's, it's this, the story that I, I think a lot of my work is about telling stories. Um, and uh, so that, that, I believe, is a really important thing. I mean, you, if I can tell you one thing you should do, I, there's a lot of people who have a lot more experience than I do here, but is to, is to find your story, uh, practice it, and tell it enough. Um, the second is, there's, we talk a lot about interdisciplinary work. I, um, I've talked about it a lot. Uh, it's, it, it's not even fashionable now. It was fashionable 15 years ago. It's like what everybody does now. Uh, but I truly believe that very few people really understand what true interdisciplinary work, uh, work research is, and even fewer do it. Uh, and when you want to do t a true interdisciplinary work, you're going to challenge institutions. You're going to make people uncomfortable, and no one likes that. Uh, so it's been it's been quite a battle to to do the kind of work that we do, um, and it's we're we're also trying to push interdisciplinarity in the area of um, questioning what is knowledge, who makes knowledge, and what is the truth, and who determines what the truth is. For whom? Um, so that's what would be in the space of inter-epistemological work. And that's another layer that is quite challenging. Um, so I don't know where I'm going with this, but I'm going to pass the mic on. I, I hope I've made sense for some of you. Um, yeah, so I, I guess we're all going to do our own interpretations of this question. <laughs> but I'm just going to try and keep it as practical as possible in terms of how you would get into this field. So I think it's really important to think about what exactly, if you're interested in, say, science journalism, science communication, or you're interested in journalism. Uh, so if you're interested in journalism, you're interested in reporting on, say, things like biodiversity issues, conservation, climate change, environment, stuff like that. In terms of how you get into the field, one, uh, the easiest way is if you manage to get some kind of formal education. If you get, like, say, a diploma in journalism from a place like Asian College of Journalism or IIMC or something like that, what happens is that a lot of uh, your traditional media outlets, they re both, uh, say, legacy newspapers as well as digital uh, media as well as television, they recruit directly from these institutions. So if you're able to afford access that kind of training, it just makes everything really easy. But if you want to do that while also being an informed reporter, journalist in these spaces, finding a way to develop that kind of scientific literacy, whether it's learning how to read papers, figuring out how to understand what a paper is actually saying and what it's not, uh, so that you're not writing headlines like, you know, coffee cures cancer and then coffee doesn't cure cancer and all of that stuff. So that is really important. Uh, you're all, it's also important to develop some understanding of the real world. It's just something that, especially if you're doing a lot of, you know, wildlife biology, um, you, if you spend a lot of time in academia, you kind of tend to lose touch with the world of politics, the world of, uh, uh, say, governance, and how these things are structured, how local politics works, how city-level politics works, or panchayat-level politics works, which if you are doing, say, on the ground conservation, like Tash is talking about, I think you would be forced to reckon with it at that point. But you need to do that even as a reporter. You need to develop some level of understanding of that, which you can do by reading widely, by uh, going to places and all of that. If you want to do... If your main interest is, you know, you're really excited by biodiversity, nature, you're excited by ecology and you want to, you know, you see people doing a lot of cool research and you want to communicate it, that kind of stuff, 
then I, I would classify that as more science communication. And the reason I'm making that distinction is that uh, both fields are hard in terms of money, in terms of accessibility, in terms of how easily and comfortably you can make a living. But journalism is worse. It's just <laughs> the reality. It's worse. So if what you're really interested in is communicating to the world all your, your excitement about nature, whatever, uh, then keep your scope of work broad, which by which I mean, learn all the skills required, whether it's writing or you know other ways of communicating, like art, if you're good at that, photography, uh, learn how to use your phone as a tool to communicate things, uh, learn how to use social media as a way to tell stories of nature, things like that. And look out for positions, work opportunities in different organizations. Many people are now very, many big organizations are now very focused on uh, communication roles, right? So look out for those things. Develop these skills along the way so that you have something to show your potential employer. If you want to do journalism, good luck to you. <laughs> but no, so I'm just kidding. But it is a really tough field because it is, I mean, largely our entire field, you know, conservation, wildlife. I think everybody here will agree it is not diverse at all. We have a, we're we're not we don't have diversity in terms of gender, caste, uh, especially caste, class, a lot of those things. So there is already a big problem here, and journalism it's I think because the field is so large it's compounded. It's just much worse. Uh, more, so if you are somebody who doesn't have financial privilege, which I had to a certain extent, so I could freelance for a few years and not know if the person I wrote, the outlet I wrote for was going to pay me on time, not pay me on time. You know, I'd be chasing them for months. The first uh, biggish place I wrote for, I, I waited one year to get paid 7,000. It's not a great space to be in. The only reason I could manage it was because I had a partner who was earning. I don't have kids or any responsibilities of that sort. I don't have to take care of my parents or something like that. So if you have those things, you are going to find it tough. I don't mean to say it to discourage people because those are the very people who need to be in these fields because they understand, uh, they have lived experiences that people with a lot more privilege don't have. And as an industry, we need to work on making that better. But at the same time, do not go in blindly, keep it in mind. Uh, so if you're freelancing as a journalist, for instance, um, apart from developing all the skills you need, like writing or photography, things like that, uh, keep keep an open mind about doing, say, a side gig, something that I would initially refuse to do because I was very strict about, oh, I'm a journalist, I'm not going to do, you know, say, take up a short-term comms role somewhere. These are very silly things that don't pigeonhole yourself, don't say that, oh, I'm only interested in wildlife journalism. But if you find there's a cool story in other fields, go and do it, because that's what a reporter does. You go out and you find out what's happening and you report it. So learn to diversify and be a bit more of a generalist if you want to have financial stability as a journalist in this field. Um, so yeah, stuff like that. And as much as possible, keep, your, keep an eye out for things like grants. There are a lot of uh, opportunities for early career journalists, grants, uh, fellowships, things like that. And do reach out to people whose work you like, journalists, or even science communicators. Most people are happy to talk. Most people are happy to communicate, uh, tell you what their work is like. They like talking about themselves, as I'm doing right now. So, you know, we do reach out to people and ask them in a nice way, respectful way, how, how to go about something or how they did something and try and get some advice. That's, that's the best I can think of, at least. All right, wow, that was super articulate, I think. You touched upon so many points. And then I think I take a lot of points from her, especially with regarding to art also. I, I When I started off, it was a very, very hard space to be in. And yes, even to get 5,000 a month or even 10,000 a month was a struggle. But I think uh, more than anything, it's a passion that lives on. Um, and you 
got to keep going if you're really interested in and definitely don't think of retiring at 40 or 50 uh, and become rich uh, when you're in an art career at all. Um, it is a lot of hard work and um, you need to project yourself, you need to build a big portfolio to showcase yourself. It's that apart, like I think nowadays, there has been a big shift in the way people are looking at art. I see so much art, wildlife art, nature art out there, and it's absolutely amazing. And I think even uh, organizations, like you were saying, are now hiring artists uh, on a full-time role in their um, uh, you know, uh, organizations to uh, be able to communicate science better. So there are opportunities out there, it's up to us how we um, can stand up to it and uh, seek these opportunities that are out there. And I think, like she said, people are open to talking and collaborating for sure. There are, uh, I think it's up to us just to go and speak and show our interest to collaborate with someone and most likely they are willing to do that, right? So the pay is um, not as great, but things are definitely improving, uh, I would say. And um, there has been a lot. I think that's because of the art community becoming so strong. Uh, the more the artists, the more the power and the more the styles that are coming out there, people have seen the importance or how amazingly we can communicate things through art. So I think that's what is making a difference why organizations are now looking up to working with artists a lot more these days. Um, I think the stronger our community gets, I think, Things will change for sure. I I have hope, so we'll see. And um, uh, with regarding to the scope and things like that, it is uh, not an easy um, uh, path. Like you give a blank canvas. There there are many many styles and approaches uh, to begin with uh, uh, with art. Uh, like for example, the style that I do is uh, more realistic, more um, uh, trying to depict capture a scene from the wilderness and onto the canvas is one of my styles. And um, uh, there are now many opportunities, like for example, um, people have been doing book illustrations, storybook illustrations are a big thing, and um, murals have become a really uh, cool aspect of communicating about wildlife these days, uh, off late since the past one year or two years, I guess. And um, uh, even infographics, and there are so many ways that you can, and of course, everyone knows Rohan's work where he communicates through humor, right? That's also a big way. So there are many styles. So I think figuring out what your style is and figuring out what you want to communicate, how you want to communicate is the first uh, aspect. There's a lot of trial and error. I think the first few years, just focus on building that portfolio, understanding wildlife, and just having about four or five wildlife illustrations in your portfolio, and then um, uh, reaching out to people doesn't always have the best of uh, impact. I would say like build a big portfolio, do a lot of sketching, go out in the field, and observe the wildlife. I think there's a big difference when you are observing wildlife in the field and then coming and uh, putting that in your uh, canvases. There's a big difference. I've known artists who uh, don't spend much time out outdoors as well, and I've known people who do. There is an amazing difference in the way they uh, depict their illustrations on paper. So I think that's a very important uh, aspect as well. Uh, as we have uh, many elephant people here, like a very small example, um, if I'm given a canvas and then asked to illustrate uh, an elephant, you know, there are so many ways of just depicting that. You know, do you show a, a whole, um, uh, you know, do you show a single elephant? Do you uh, show many elephants? Do you show the tusker? Do you show the female? Do you show the back pose? Do you show the front pose? Like there's no end to imagining how you want to. That's why the blank, blank canvas is usually so scary for anybody. So, but um, being able to um, figure out what you want to tell your audience and that will help you uh, compose your thoughts and then be able to put out what you have to put out. And um, yeah, I think I'll stop there <laughs> and then I'll... Thanks so much uh, for that. And I think we've uh, 
collectively now given everyone a lot of context for the different kinds of work you can do in the field and i'm sure a lot of people have questions for our panelists as well so maybe we can do that now uh, so if the volunteers can go around with mics does anyone here have questions yeah one up there hi uh, uh, thank you bhanu for touching on the point of financial stability uh, so the thing is uh, even if you are uh, like say i am privileged and i don't need to take care of my parents on a daily basis but in case of an emergency or something uh, of that kind i would have to but i can't because we are paid so less in our field even after years of working so i want to ask how as a community uh, doing anything research uh, practicing conservation art journalism anything how can we increase or improve the pay scale like sh shall we uh, uh, ask for more funds or uh, budget our project such that everyone is paid at least uh, in uh, in terms to what the uh, financial uh, conditions are in our like place to take care of at least health and other necessities uh, yeah that's me okay honest answer you have to unionize if if everybody gets together forms a union and demands that different organizations use their budgets to pay well then you will get it but uh, that is a tough thing and you have to mobilize a lot of forces but it's it's a i'm, I'm not saying it flippantly because we do tend to look at these things as a joke but that kind of uh collective power is the only real way to get fair wages apart from that you have to keep having this conversation one of the things um that i think you can everybody can do is you have to start shaming organizations that offer that offer unpaid internships and especially if they are based in uh you know like you know, researchers from yale coming here and saying i'll give you a good ex and you'll have a good experience in field or you'll learn a lot from me but don't expect money shame those people you have to do that a lot this has to just become a norm and this is this is also true for media outlets including mine they don't pay for internships it's a big problem something we we've tried raising and i understand that a lot of organizations especially if you're non-profits you have a big problem of funding but don't promise your funders something you can't deliver on because you can't pay free you know fair you can only do it if you take you know whatever force people to work for free because then also you're limiting the pool to people with a lot of privilege as you said anybody who wants to be able to do anything for their family is going to have to think twice about taking an unpaid internship it re reduces diversity so all that talk about inclusivity diversity all of those things become useless so i think that's the uh, simplest thing i can think of but the most important thing if you want structured fair wages is actually we have to form unions <laughs> oh sorry i didn't um so i'd like to maybe add a little bit on this which is uh, slightly a different perspective maybe partly because i live in the nilgiris and work uh closely with very local people there uh the perception on the ground very much say in the forest department circles and among local people is that ngo salaries are very high right so this comes to the question of that there is huge disparity within india between rural india and urban india in what is fair and rural and what is a reasonable amount of money to live um part of the reason i choose to live in the nilgiris is that my monthly rent in bangalore is enough for me to live my whole life with my child and my family quite comfortably in good luck right uh so you don't need as much money like the amount of money you need in a city to live is phenomenal these days um so this is not an easy question to answer because if conservation becomes uh say aligned more closely with the say salaries in the corporate world in a in a city you are going to increase the gap between rural and urban india even more like in gudlore we are considered very uh, highly paid like people who work for the real elephant collective are paid much more than average in that people almost get upset that why you all pay so much to young people we've been working for so many years and we get only so little these young people think they are too big for their boots because they get big jobs with you types you know but we pay way less than uh, any of the urban counterparts even within the ngo world uh, 
because we hire all local uh, people from that landscape particularly uh, indigenous people if we can so this is not an easy question to answer it's linked to a much broader societal problem of inequality um and i don't think there are there is any easy way to uh, overcome this i think it's going to be a challenge um it's going to be a difficult thing for everybody but i think more and more in the world when you can work remotely choosing to live out of a big city i think is a very empowering sort of decision you suddenly have a lot of freedom um you don't have to worry so much about uh, how much money you're making every day uh, every month there is more flexibility in what you can do and what you can choose to do thanks yeah. agree with everything just one just a few uh, points that i'd like to share i think in general conservation uh, there is a sense that it's like a moral discipline and if you have to do this thing which is about ethics and morality and saving the world then you must you must sacrifice and so there's generations of people who have uh, internalized it that this is how life is going to be and that re- reflects in the many the ways in which we raise funds and write project grants we write project grants that promise our donors a lot with the least amount of effort or at least you know most buck for uh, most bang for their buck and so we ask for little if we ask our donors that this is not fair that this is people need to be paid more i think donors will also change the way they look at conservation um so i yeah i think also that you know we maybe grant writing is also where we need to start changing hi good evening yeah uh yeah first of all thank you for sharing all your experiences my question is how does one deal with the limitations to changing the career towards conservation i know it's already something wrong but to be specific uh, there are societal limitations which i feel to an extent one could deal with uh, based on their willpower but far more important is the limitations from the system as a whole for example uh, you need a degree to start certain jobs and if okay if you manage to decide to get a degree there's like an age limit so the system is telling that okay after this age stop studying it just blows my mind so how does one deal with such things i well maybe i can start Yeah. 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 <laughs> I can I can start as someone who studied the longest and changed career or disciplines for every degree. Um it is not easy. Um I was able to do that because I don't come from a a lot of uh, money. I think my I don't come from a rich family, but one privilege that I had amongst others was that my parents didn't depend on me to put food on the table. So I could say I don't care about you I'm going to pursue my dreams and just leave. And if I if I went through really tough times of my own but at least they didn't depend on me. So that was one I think one privilege I had which allowed me to do what I did. Um but also when you are switching careers I think play on your strengths while while you get into a new discipline like for a very long time I offered my engineering skills to conservationists um and that's how i uh, my could they i was able to put my foot in the door and then slowly you know pick up what they do and become kind of them um in terms of the structure i i can't answer the age question really because again because i've been fortunate to be to be educated abroad where age is not really seen as a deterrent but i understand that to get government jobs here there is an age cap gap that age is not really i don't see that as a as a limit in pro, in conservation ngos as much i think it's the public sector uh, and the private sector also i don't see the age as a as a factor uh, structures are a factor but where you should play on your strengths to get in, your foot in the door and then pick up uh, pick up some of the skills uh, i hope you were mentioning what said have uh, mentioned because into government system there are uh, qualifications and uh, age barrier things but uh, with respect to upsc exams there is basic degree that is uh, demanded any kind of degree you can uh, apply for the exam 
and your scores in the college or any additional qualifications doesn't actually uh, add to any of the points only your preparation your during your preliminary and mains exam and interview will actually score you people used to ask me if i have some certificates i have done some uh, special courses i have g- gained such points so it will it be useful in uh, uh, clearing this exam easier but that is not the case it is only the effort you put after your graduation for uh, this exam and many of my friends uh, after degree they have been into engineering because my batch mates we were 80 in our batch i was batch 2018 uh, 95 of our batch mates of my batch mates are from engineering background from and uh, 90 yeah 95 percentage were from iits and bits and uh, many people were having work experience in one or the other companies two or three years the age limit of 32 uh, the average age of our uh, batch was 28 there were people from 24 till uh, 35 and things because the age barrier was 32 for uh, obc category so uh, that is also a good one way because we keep we cannot keep on preparing without earning something uh, for a long time uh, so we have these restrictions in government but uh, uh, once you get uh, being a direct officer one important thing to be a direct officer is you, young minds will be coming into service either before a service or administrative service or police service that will be a mix of young minds and experienced people who come as promoted officers to the uh, district postings. So the main uh, criteria of taking direct recruits is putting that young minds into the system. So there has to be, uh, there is age restriction and uh, we are not here to quote on whether to be here or not. But in government system, we have both restrictions that you were speaking about. But when it comes to conservation efforts, uh, with the NGO people with, with whom I am working with, there is no age restriction, I would say. I meet people from, I would say, at the age of 18 till the age of 70 and 80 who have a lot of experience to share with me. And I would, li- I would say they are guiding me in a lot of aspects. Because when one animal comes out, as Tasha mentioned, if an elephant comes out, a uh, conservationist will tell, we do not stress the animal. Madam, please don't capture and release us first. Don't take it as a first resort. Please do not do that. And uh, police department will be saying that we are experiencing law and order problem in the field. And the farmer out will be telling, my crop is getting raided. Please capture this animal and put it away. And we are worried about this EB department. These EB lines are going there and here and there. And we are worried about elephant being caught in the EB lines and highways and uh, everything. So it is it is very difficult on this side to take, de- to take decision independently. So we take all the... Uh, recommendations and discussions from various age group we could say so the conservation is being more experienced is actually good to the system thank you so much do you have a point to add um so I, yeah just a quick point to add to this um in the sense of value of getting a degree i think is something that we shouldn't overlook not necessarily a formal degree but trying to think i should get into a field which i know nothing about but I should be welcomed with open arms, is kind of impossible in any field. I can't say tomorrow I'm going to be a doctor or a doctor is much more technical, but I can't choose to join any profession without any idea of what's happening there, right? So I feel uh, having some sort of, I mean, that's why I decided to do a master's degree. I was doing all sorts of conservation stuff as a kind of activist and felt I don't know what I'm doing, uh, something that Banu also touched on. What should you do in conservation, since it's such a new field, is not something we know about. So I don't think you should, we should undervalue um, the motivation or the requirement to actually learn about this formally, spend time thinking about it, it is very complex. A lot of conservation decisions that seem very easy uh, and uh, which activists are say, very keen on, don't ever capture the elephant, be very nice to it, don't capture the tiger, is affecting the lives of people in very immediate ways. People are getting killed by animals, 500 people a year by elephants. Uh, so I think it is important in some way to learn about this more seriously rather than engage just in a more superficial way. Using, coming from a very different skill set. Thanks. Thank you so much, Darsh. And uh, thanks for your questions as well. Uh, and hello. Sorry. Uh, uh, hello. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hello. Uh, my question is to Sahil, sir. Uh, sir, do, do, sir, here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
सर डू यू थिंक योर जर्नी वुड बी द सेम इफ यू स्टेड बैक इन इंडिया आफ्टर योर इंजीनियरिंग Okay. Yeah. This is this could be a long answer, but I'll ask you to keep it a little short in because of time. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much. Um, I just want to really thank all of you for all of the insights you've given us here today. I know these were really big questions, and we didn't get through a whole lot of them, but. I'm I really appreciate the answers that you've given and hopefully it was useful for uh, everyone here as well. Uh our panelists are around now even after this session and so if you have any burning questions for them do ask them. Uh and thank you so much for being here and listening. Thanks so much guys.